All right. Thank you, Leah. Thank you to the Walker Institute and for Weber State University and everyone who's here today uh, for supporting this event. And thank you, Congressman Moore, for joining us. So we're going to be talking today about federal deficits, federal debt, and uh, federal taxes. Um, <laughs> this is an exciting topic. That's right. Just, yeah, yeah <laughs> Just it gets get you out of bed in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, we have a great, great, great showing. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, uh, so, Congressman Moore, um, you've been in office since uh, 20, in the 2020 election was your first, right? And so since 2021. Um, currently, the federal debt stands a little over $32 trillion. Uh, it's owned uh, you know, about a third by U.S. investors, various kinds. The U.S. government or the Federal Reserve owns about 38% of it, and foreign investors, 29%. Um, and recently, right, the uh, federal government got its credit rating downgraded in part, uh, there's various reasons, but in yeah. part because of the size of the federal debt and how, maybe more so, how um, Congress has dealt with that, you know, kind of that's, last that's, minute deal. You just nailed the exact two reasons why it happened. Um, and yeah, I remember having these conversations leading up to the debt ceiling all, all, fall, all, all spring. And um, it's frustrating when you can see the potential of what's gonna happen. You know about it for months and we still sort of do the same thing over and over again. Uh, and it came from my brother who's in wealth management, finance. He's like, why is it that you guys always wait to the very last minute? This concept of brinkmanship is, is one of the most frustrating things that I have to deal with with respect to all fiscal matters. The two things, waiting to the very last second so everybody panics about when this is gonna happen and then using all that leverage that exists uh, with it and second, the fact that we don't have a strong balance sheet. We don't have a strong fiscal footing. Those are the two reasons. So um, that's why you get potential downgrades to take place because we have too much debt and we don't deal with it and we, 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 create, it to, we create it for it to be too, of a, too much of a political um, football that gets passed back and forth. So talk about that a little more. I mean, you know, if you look at the, at the growth of federal debt and deficits over time, it's grown under, you know, Republican administrations, Democrat administrations, whoever controls Congress. So with that kind of momentum, uh, how do you get anything accomplished on this issue? Because it just, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you pull that off as a congressman in your, in your view? Uh, with specific to the debt ceiling? Or? Well, just specific to, to change you made the debt trajectory right. and things like that. Yeah, I'm a strong supporter of using, the, using our debt to GDP ratio as a as more of a metric that we we, we operate on and it, it can't be a perfect science because there's some predictability that needs to take place because you don't necessarily know exactly what revenues are going to be um, you have a little bit more control over what the expenses will be but you, you don't always know what revenues will be but if we were to get it to a point where we were weren't constantly just every year and a half or however long dealing with the with this debt ceiling it's like a once it's a snapshot in time uh, Whenever it comes up, you don't know what you don't know who's going to be in the White House. You don't know who's going to be leading House in the Senate. Um, then it just becomes hyper political. Instead, we as members of Congress should be looking on an annual basis, looking at our at our health via uh, a debt to GDP ratio, using that to determine what we have capacity to spend, what we need to be able to find areas um, that we have to that we have to cut, and um, making sure that our revenues are strong. So, like. We, we would we, we it's it's more of a budgeting process reform which I'm glad to see the the, the leadership uh, with Jody Arrington who's the chair of the budget committee and his counterpart on the Democrat side coming together and saying hey there's some there's some significant reform that we need to we need to address I've spoken about it and published information about this in our in our in our debt and deficit task force that it's actually a um, group of northern Utah business leaders and economists and attorneys and accountants that, that have gotten and healthcare experts they, we, we meet regularly and we put out some recommendations. So the, the reform process would, would go a long way and those are kind of some of the things that they're, they're discussed but we keep falling back into the same rut. That rut creates an opportunity for us to get downgraded. So polarization in particular has kind of seems to poison everything nowadays, right? Um, in terms of making progress. How do you navigate that specific uh, dynamic of of you know the fear of say getting primaried if you do some significant reform if it means you know, crossing the aisle and working with people on the other side. Those kinds of political fears that are driven by more extreme kind of polarized views in, in politics. 
Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's a tough thing for for every member of Congress to to, to deal with. I want to serve in this capacity. Um, I am going to run for re-election again, and I know that that everybody faces a primary, right? And um, we just we have to still be rooted in we we have to do what's best, and debt is bad. <laughs> like that's that's the way I go about thinking over most every scenario. Debt is bad. Why is debt bad? One reason: interest. Interest is good when you're earning it. Interest is bad when you're paying it. And we are paying more in interest this year than we ever have, right? And we're going to continue to pay hundreds of billions of dollars more in interest annually. Um, so we have to be willing to go and address this. Um, as part of the debt ceiling negotiations, it was actually really great to see multiple angles from uh, across the Republican conference. You saw Democrats interested in this. And it's something we've seen before. You've seen Simpson Bowles. You've seen the Greenspan Commission. You've seen commissions come together to identify and really put forth the best possible data and, and uh, solutions for addressing our massive deficit and, and debt interest problems. Uh, the issue with these particular commissions is they can always be leveraged by leadership. Whoever is the Speaker of the House, Republican or Democrat, you know, they're going to, in order to, to, to move forward on something like that, there's always going to be other things at play. But what you saw in Congress recently was like, no, if we do a commission where we put all the data there, come up with the solutions, we want this to come directly to the floor. We want members of Congress to be able to actually vote on this without it going, um, you know, without it being leveraged. Put it through the regular process and get it to the floor. And you might have some real solutions that, that, that come of it. Uh, and um, yeah, the primary thing, I'm not worried about it. If I, I, will always exp I will always show up and explain and do my part to, to communicate any potential issues. Usually it's a misconception. And that's what I witnessed, you know, kind of like through my first two and a half years of this. Most things, there's a, there's a misconception. Um, Media tries to distort something. Other, you know, other colleagues from any ideology, from in the Democrat and Republican conference, like there is, there's some motivation because you can get more attention on social media to distort the truth. And I would rather just deal with the reality of it and then show up through my newsletter, through town halls and things like that. Show up and explain it. And I'm telling you, it's been an amazing experience uh, to kind of go through that process and actually earn people's trust. To have somebody come to a town hall and say, hey, why'd you do this? And then you share the context and to see them say like, oh, yeah, I can see why I was lied to. I can see why I, that media outlet that, that made me believe what this was. Thank you for explaining the reality of it. And uh, I'll, just keep, I'll just keep doing that and I hope other members will, 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 will do the same. And um, <laughs> we have to recognize in Congress, whether you're in the House or the Senate, that there's this thing called the filibuster. And it's not something that I just say I want to support if it's at threat, if it's, if, if it's being threatened to take the filibuster away. Like, I don't want to just defend it then. Like, you need to value the filibuster. You need to realize that there has to be um, an ability to move things forward and to accomplish something that exists. And so if you're going to do party line votes only, that's a messaging bill. And so we can either be messengers or we can be legislators. And uh, you know, we're going to have to decide between them. And there's both back there right now, for sure. Yeah. You talk about um, communicating in town halls and in situations like that. This is an issue where the numbers are astronomical, right? $32 trillion, really impossible to get your brain around that. The, the $1.5 trillion deficit is even more astronomical that we don't, we don't do enough to focus on. Mm -hmm. we, we have a $6.2 trillion budget and about... 4.5, 4.7 trillion of revenue. That's a massive gap, yeah. and it's and it's continuing to grow. And how do you communicate that to uh, to you know people who are not insiders in the process, so in a way that makes it makes sense to them, and and helps them understand why why they should care about it? You know, I mean, of course, everybody thinks debt is bad, but why should the average voter really care about this? Issue? This feels like a planted question because it's it's like the best question I've ever had. <laughs> My whole series of town halls over the last year, I actually decided with my team, and they're laughing now, 
I said, I need slides. <laughs> I need to put slides up in front of folks. That's how I used to communicate uh, when I was in consulting prior to, to joining Congress, how to my client, we would do the work, we would analyze the data, we would come up with solutions, and we had to communicate everything. So I finally just decided to do a 20 minute slideshow at the start of every one of my town halls, explaining where we came from, why we are where we are with this current fiscal situation, and, and really, really explain the reality. Because in the absence of that, all you hear about is the annual appropriations bills, right? And so there's two aspects of our, of our budget. There's the direct mandatory spending, and then there's the discretionary spending. The discretionary spending is really the only thing Congress votes on every year. And guess what? That's only about 1.4 to $1.7 trillion of a $6 trillion budget. The vast majority of the other side of it is the direct spending that just exists. These are government programs that were put in place, and because it's politically tumultuous to address them, they're tough to, they just get put on autopilot, right? 1935, Social Security, we really haven't reformed it as we've gone along. Reform is a good word. Reform is something that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about, although it becomes very politically difficult because it becomes a wedge issue, and then people distort what's actually going on. Um, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, the welfare programs. Um, our defense budget is discretionary, uh, but we have we have seventy one percent of our budget today will be in mandatory spending. When fifty years ago that was only thirty three percent. So the growth of that has eclipsed the growth of our discretionary budget. But this fall, if we shut the government down, what will it be over? It will be over that discretionary budget of approximately $1.5 trillion, which is, a, which is a fraction of our entire budget. And of that $1.5 trillion, 800 of it, more than half of it, is defense. And the first, first district supports defense. That's what Hill Air Force Base is. That's what our, our, our veterans, our, our soldiers, we support that. That's a constitutional duty that we should be supporting. That's, where we, that's one thing we must be supportive of. And then, so that breaks down even farther, and smaller and smaller. And so what we actually haggle over when you get to a potential government shutdown is, I don't know, 40 to $50 billion of a $6 trillion budget. We don't have adults in the room back in Washington really addressing the major issues because of the political <coughs> advantageous nature of, oh, if somebody talks about the real problem, well, I'm going to hit them on that in the next election. And then it becomes a very, you know, a, a very partisan fight that that uh, you know we have to be willing to get past so you mentioned the mandatory spending where 70 percent is on autopilot is that a good thing would you change that and how would you go about addressing that or should you would you should we, do we need to leave that as it is yeah in fact I'm working on something with Americans for prosperity right now uh, on, a, on a bill that's going to do a, a significant reform um, that sort of wipes away just this concept of, oh, it just is it going to exist and we're going to continue to build and build and build. We have to be willing to address this type of stuff. And you know, the first step in it, so we have a major problem with the potential retirement uh, trust funds for our nation. In, 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 in 10 years, 2033, the Social Security Trust Fund will, will go insolvent. And at that point, if we do nothing about this, our Social Security recipients will receive 75%, an immediate 25% cut to their benefit if we don't do anything in the next decade. And uh, that's just unacceptable, in my opinion. So what, we, what, what, what what's one thing Congress has done? It's called Secure 2.0. Probably one of my favorite bills. I talk about it quite a bit. Secure 2.0 was passed in the 117th Congress with over 400 votes. Uh, very, very um, widely accepted. Um, and what that does is it allows Americans to be able to save for retirement earlier. It reduces some of that regulation and that burden that, that, that helps employers and it helps individuals put more money away earlier. The more you put away at a younger age, it, it, it grows, obviously, it compounds significantly. Um, another thing that, that my team in particular is working on is ESOPs. These are employee stock ownership programs, right? Like, uh, things that we need to grow the middle class that will ensure we have private sector, um, not just wholly focused and, and, re 
uh, relying on government to, to solve this problem for us, we need to implement programs that will help people save for retirement much younger in their life, right? Those that have paid into the system, elderly Americans, seniors right now, like this, no one, we're not touching this. Like this is, this is not something, you know, no one needs to be scared to talk about it. But we have to be willing to talk about the future. And, um, and there are things that are, that, that, are, that, are, that are being done now and we need to do more. We missed a huge opportunity. Uh, and, and, and I would put, you know, as I've looked back on this and I wasn't in Congress, I wasn't even really aware of what was going on. Um, this was the early 2000s. George W. Bush had a, and his team, they had a plan. They, they, had, they, they saw the, the, um, the retirement, the baby boomers start retirement timeline. And we've known that. So 2008, when we start to see a lot more retirements take place, uh, we had a plan to get out ahead of that a little bit. Putting some of uh, your opting in for the, the trust fund and for that contribution to, to your social security, to being able to go into to mutual funds. Not, a, not an American today. Any, it, not a single American, if they were serious, would look back and say, oh, that would have been a dumb idea. I mean, the S&P was closing at $900 then, it's closing at $4,000 now. We could, have, we could have grown and done more to support and have more available to do it, but it becomes a partisan issue uh, and they, they weren't able to, to get it done. Democrats will always sort of say, oh, you just want Wall Street to do it. No, we want to be able to grow and support our retirement class. So that opportunity, that, that ship has sailed. But I like to see what we're doing now and making it so it's easier for younger Americans to be able to, to save for retirement because this in the next 10 years is gonna be a huge fight. And I'm thrilled to be on Ways and Means Committee where this is where the fight is gonna happen. I'm on the Social Security Subcommittee. Um, Ways and Means covers tax, trade, healthcare. I mean, those are the reasons we're in debt. Those are the main reasons. Healthcare is the biggest problem. Um, our costs are not going down um, and it just continues to, to grow. And, it's, and it is, this, is, this is where the areas have to be solved. And you have to be willing to work together. Otherwise, we get, we get stuck in a rut of you know, once in a generation legislating. When you have the White House, House, and Senate, you try to get something done, and you see that ping-ponging back and forth. And it's, it's just not a good way to, to, to really sustainably look towards the next 30 to 50 years. So one, one final question on debts and deficits before we go on to taxes. There are, from economists, a couple of different ideas that would seem to complicate the idea of addressing this issue. One uh, that it seems to be gaining purchase on, on one side of the, the aisle is the idea that basically debt doesn't matter, right? We, we owe it to ourselves just an immaterial thing. Um, a second one uh, that I've seen is the, the prediction by some economists that high levels of debt to GDP are simply the new normal, practically speaking, and it's not really re realistic to change that. How do you address this issue when those kinds of ways of thinking about it are gaining purchase? Well, let me just say this. You can record it. You can do anything you want with it. Clip it. If modern <coughs> monetary theory takes over as the predominant thought and it is widely accepted, I'm out. <laughs> Consider me done. This is not, that is not where I'm going. Uh, there is no way that, 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 that we can accept that debt doesn't matter uh, because that interest in a few years will be higher, that we're paying annually, will be higher than our defense budget. That puts us at significant rates. The reason why it hasn't been majorly, it hasn't been a major catastrophe yet, is because the US dollar is the, the world's reserve status, right? It's, our, it's, a, it's, a, reserve, it's a reserve currency. Um, when that starts to get threatened, that's when it becomes a real potential. So that's my response to debt doesn't matter is, it, 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 when we lose that significant advantage, I'll say, as the, as the world's reserve status, we have, we have major problems and um, we need to be more responsible to help get us out ahead of that and make sure we're in a, in a, in a strengthening position. The second question. Uh, just on the idea that, that high levels of debt to GDP are debt to GDP. Here's the way I look at it. Like, you're not gonna get a balanced budget by next year. Um, you would have to you would have to cut Social Security in half, Medicare. I mean, it, it's we've gotten to, we didn't get to this point overnight. Um, there was poor planning that went into the, you know the last 30, 40 years of, of this. This did not happen overnight. Um, we have to, to to chip away at it. I look at it as um, debt to GDP is as high as it was from World War II. The problem that we have now is the programs that exist and the reasons for the debt aren't as easily solvable as they were in post-World War II. 
where was the majority of our spending? World War II. Obviously, it was defense. Well, we had a, 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 obviously, we had the Korean War and you had the Cold War as things ramped up there, but we didn't have the significant expense that we did um, and that, that, that rush of, of, of uh, revenue that was needed for, um, or expenses that were needed for, the world, for world War II. We're now, we, so we can't dial it back like we did um, after 1945. We dialed some of that back. We got our debt to GDP significantly lowered. We would go through a year, 10 to 15 years, we would get a balanced budget. We are now, what, since 1997, we're well over 20, we're almost 25 years from having a balanced budget. That's a significant time frame that we haven't been able to, to, to get to that point. That's very concerning to me because that adds strength and confidence to the U.S. system. And if that becomes out of control, then it's, it's more difficult. So if we had a 0.7 debt to GDP, I would take it today. <laughs> like if you, if you could tell me like, hey, I'm gonna, I, I, if, you, here, if, we, if you vote in this structure, we can get our debt to GDP to, 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 to 70%. We're nearing 130%. I'd take it. It's not a balanced budget, but it would move it in the other direction. So I want to be somebody that's back there to help move our debt to GDP in a downward trajectory. That's what happened in World War II. It didn't happen overnight, but it was, it was easier because we could ramp down our, our spending in certain ways. We can't ramp down that spending so much because we have um, uh, di different types of programs, but we have to be willing to say, what is gonna lower that? What would, what would we do to reduce that? All right, with that, let's shift to, to taxes. Everyone cares about uh, taxes. How, how would you rate the U.S. federal income tax system? You know, good, bad, or ugly? What, what is it about it that is good? What needs to change? What should those reforms look like? So uh, that's a great, that's a great question. Right now, it's a, it's a little bit ugly. Here's why: um, In 2017, uh, uh, you saw take place a lot of things that I'm very supportive of, and I wasn't in Congress then. I'm not taking credit for any of it, but it's all expiring now. I will say this: the um, the presidential election in 2024, uh, all the, you know, obviously House of Representatives is, is every cycle, the Senate's at play. The election right now, you know, is shaping up to be, uh, if we have the front runners in those positions, is shaping up to be a narrative about all the things that Trump is going through with these indictments and all the things the Biden family has done with respect to money laundering and uh, you know, payments from, you know, malign actors. Those are going to be the leading narratives in this next presidential election. And the, the narrative that should be, should be solely based on energy and tax policy. Um, in my pragmatic mind, I wish that that's what, that's what I could just blanket across our country is Tax Cut and Jobs Act, all the provisions will be expired by 2025. Uh, there's some things that continue on, corporate tax rates, things like that, but, but there's a lot of things within that, that tax policy. And then in the last two years, several things have already taken place. So the thing that I'm most concerned about, and why I say ugly, is because I have three individual friends um, run their own business. They are, they're buddies of mine. They're, they're, they're <clears throat> mid to low 40s, and they're panicking right now because of this thing called the R&D tax credit. So from the dawn of time, basically since the 1950s, but I know the dawn was earlier than that, but <coughs> you could actually expense your R&D, you know, you, you could write, you could use that, you could expense that um, as a tax incentive the year that you make, that you incur those costs. In the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it was spread out to amortize that over five years, once like 2021 hit. Well, that has now hit, and we haven't been able to, 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 to get it back to that do you know expense it in the first year and it's causing a lot of problems for a lot of american businesses i mean who does r d most every industry that's out there and there it's it's a it's a it's something that i'm, I'm very concerned about um and there's a lot of us working it's it is a very very bipartisan issue but again whenever something's very popular it oftentimes gets held up uh because leadership wants to control things one way or the other this particular situation largely supported in a bipartisan way, but Senate leader Chuck Schumer, he's going to kind of hold it hostage unless they get enough of the child tax credit that they want to do. Mind you, in 2017, the child tax credit was actually doubled by Republicans. I mean, so it's a bizarre world back there in the tax world in a lot of ways, but it's very concerning to me about you know, where we're going. And if everything expires, depending on what uh, political situation you'll have in Congress and in the White House, 
uh, it's going to be a very different it's going to be a very di different tax situation going forward, and uh, and we need to make sure that we have economic growth as a as a as a as a, as a, um, a, f a strong focus. That is the best way to raise revenues, right? So. You mentioned leaders trying to use issues to cajole things and hold hold them hostage. Does that leadership centric way of making decisions need to change to make real progress on these fiscal issues, or can you navigate the current system and still? Yeah, you, you don't. Know, you see a lot of things that are very popular that would that, that if you were to bring it to the floor, it would pass with a with a significant margin. Um, but there's always an agenda in in, in Washington, and, and both parties are, are are at play here. And uh, like this is one specific one, the R and D tax credit. If it was a, so if it was a standalone bill that came to the floor, you'd see it pass with overwhelming support. Um, this affects companies in Republican and Democrat districts. Uh, it affects, like I said, so many different industries. And um, you know, I would uh, that that's that that would be something that would be fascinating to to see play out. But I don't know how to fix that as of yet. Yeah. Let's get a little deeper on the on the kind of the tax credit. There are tax credits, deductions, exemptions. You know, a lot of which a lot of people are familiar with. Some some not more complicated. Some people like to refer to these as tax expenditures, right, uh, as a term, because they reduce federal income tax revenue. And right now, uh, based on certain estimates, there's over 1.3 trillion dollars worth of those tax expenditures. What is your take on that that menu of credits and deductions in the income tax system? Is that something that's a, a bad approach to doing tax policy? Is it good? Are there certain ones you would definitely get rid of, certain ones you definitely keep? How do, how do you view? Absolutely. Those? There are some that I'm, I'm just fighting for. I'm just talking about R&D tax credit as something that I would, law, I, I, would, I would strongly support. And there are definitely other things. The, things within the Inflation Reduction Act. Obviously, I wasn't supportive of that. I, am, I, I think we need to be having a, <coughs> you know, an all the above energy approach and it's very difficult to just kind of pick winners and losers. I was always, you know, I remember writing, a, I, I got a master's in public policy. I remember writing a uh, position paper um, using Solyndra as an example. And as I was on the, 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 um, the Conservation Climate and Energy Task Force, headed by Kathy McMorris Rogers, John Curtis was, on, you know, was, a, was a leader in this, Garrett Graves, Stan Crenshaw, uh, we, we wanted just a more sensible approach. We want to make sure Republicans also get on board and, and, and be able to talk energy and, and uh, policy better. And um, I remember thinking, you guys, this, this bill that's coming in front of us is just Solyndra on steroids. And everybody agrees that taking the approach of Solyndra was a mistake. I mean, even the Obama administration recognizes like, yeah, it was a flop, right? We, it, 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 we don't have, we don't, we don't operate the same way China does, thankfully. Like China operates in a way where they don't care. They are just predatorily, you know, subsidizing something to totally distort the market. And it, it's not the long game. It's not the best way to, 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 to make, you know, things play out. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do that in, in, in the U.S. Um, you know, comparatively, we, 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 you know, we often get down that road with some of these expenditures like you're talking about. But we, we, we can't just be out there, you know, picking winners and losers when it, when it, doesn't ultimately have the, the the full right impact that we're that we would need anyway. So there's things like that that I'm obviously not supportive. Generally, you know, I would be a more simplified tax code guy, and I think many of us in this room, many of us in this room would agree with that. Uh, there is so many different angles and loopholes and things that that, that get played out uh, based on certain interests and everything that exists. Trying to simplify these things would would help. Uh, 2017 did a lot of that. It doubled what you could do. I mean, it doubled the standard deduction. So most Americans actually then just took the standard deduction. But what's the downside to that? Any guesses? Increasing the standard deduction? There were concerns about charitable deductions. There it is, example. yeah. So a very excellent moderator, by the way, because I set him up there with the question. <laughs> yeah, we, we've seen a big de decline in charitable contributions because you're not able to use your charitable contributions to write off some of the things. And so with more people taking the standard deduction, they get that write off anyway. Um, and maybe it doesn't, whatever they were doing charity wise, wasn't superseding that, uh, that. So maybe they saw, ah, I'm not going to get the write off. So maybe I don't donate to that charity. I hate seeing that. So I'm actually, we've introduced our office um, in conjunction with Senator Lankford, um, who's a Baptist minister. Please do not quote me. That may be 
a Southern Baptist, I don't know exactly the, the denomination, but a former minister. Um, and, uh, you know, we're trying to create an opportunity for some plus up that if you are, you know, contributing to a nonprofit uh, in your community, that that would also be a, another tax benefit to you. So, you know, tax incentives, I'm definitely supportive of them. I don't like it when they get, you know, down, the, they get too myopic in, in nature and, and, and don't have the right outcomes of, 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 you know, actually solving or creating better impact. It's a tough, it's a, it's a tough equation to figure out all that, but um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's why it's the tough work in Congress and it's why it's what we should be heavily focused on more than a lot of the other stuff you see members focused on. So income taxes get most of the attention, <clears throat> but there are obviously other forms of federal taxes, payroll taxes that go to pay for Social Security, Medicare, and uh, tariffs, which you can view as a, as a tax on trade effectively, international trade, right? Uh, shifting to those two issues for a moment, are those tax systems properly structured uh, for their purposes? Do they need to be reformed? And, and if, if you think they should be reformed, what should those reforms look like? A any reform that I'm gonna try to advocate for will be for strong economic growth and increasing our participation rate. So the particip so if we, we've had several questions on tax right now. All that matters with tax is revenue. Revenue is what's the key part of that side of the equation. Our expenses are way too high. Our government spends too much money. Uh, when I say the discretionary budget is not the problem, I don't mean the discretionary budget isn't isn't too isn't too small. It is too big. Every aspect of our government spends too much money. Over a six trillion dollar budget, with you know, with with deficits that we have, we obviously have a problem there. Um, but if we're going to look specifically at tax and revenue, we have to make sure our participation rate is high. What policies promote work? What policies promote American ingenuity? and what policies keep these American um, <coughs> multinational firms, what keeps that revenue in the US, right? And if we create too high of taxes, guess what? We live in a globalized world now. It's not very difficult to move your company offshore anymore. It was 100 years ago. You know, there was a lot of capital expenditures and everything. <coughs> You're working with, with tech companies that they don't they don't necessarily have a lot of you know brick and mortar you know investment here. It's not like a big manufacturing move a manufacturing plant still happens, but that's a little bit more difficult than just moving a corporate office or something. Remember when I lived in Singapore, I did my taxes one year, and I saw um, the top tax rate is something that I was like, why why well no wonder. This, no wonder uh, it was a mining company that it existed in, in, in Australia. No wonder they set up their corporate offices there because the tax rate was incredible. And guess what? That benefits Singapore and it, will, and it doesn't benefit where the actual resources are and where most of those jobs are. So we have to incent use our tax structure to create revenue by doing it in a healthy way. And, uh, and that's to encourage um, you know, strength in, in the American economy. What you're seeing right now, and it's very convoluted, it's a very difficult thing to understand why it's going on, uh, but the global minimum tax and what's called pillar two is, is, is very dangerous. Um, this, is, th this, will, this will ultimately um, move revenue to other countries. So if you have, if you have operations in, in another country, uh, the design for this, and it took place through the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act will move this revenue, and um, it will go and benefit many countries in the European Union. And um, it's going to be, and it's something that the Biden administration is kind of, kind of slow walking and moving it forward, inch by inch. And uh, it's obviously it wouldn't pass Congress <coughs> today, but they're moving it inch by inch. Uh, when we already have something in place called Guilty that was put in place with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, it's. Uh, trying to level the playing field and it actually is just gonna you know I think that the, the, the strongest predictions is that it will that it'll hurt American companies right this issue is uh, had a lot of 
doom and gloom around it, right? Let's yeah. let's end on a hopeful let's note. Hopeful <laughs> I actually, uh, had a, there was an article in the Deseret News that, that that actually showed my optimism on this, and uh, I, I even I I was looking at that copy of it again today before I came because I know it's a tough topic, but there's things we can do. There is things we can do. So please. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask, as someone who is working on lawmaking, policy making, ways that are not really observed, right? We see people go on on TV, but you miss a lot of the real work that gets done. What sources of optimism have you seen in Congress that you'd want to share with people to 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 let them know that there there is some hope on the horizon, whether it's in taxes, uh, debts, or or just more broadly? Right. So. Um like I mentioned with like Secure 2.0, over 400 people came on board, members of Congress, to, just to sign on to this. Uh, there is a desire to say, to recognize, okay, these big government programs in 1935 established, um, we, 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 it's almost been around 100 years. At a 100 year mark, it's kind of ironic that in 2033, about 100 years later, that it goes insolvent. We have to be willing to address it. Uh, so there's that recognition there is um, a, a desire to make sure that the next generation has a path forward, um, and you know, it'll take some, you know, it'll 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 take. It's not just going to happen in a in, in a in a vacuum. There has to be something like, hey, we've got to get this done by this particular date, and it's going to take some leadership to say, let's not wait till brinkmanship of of that timeline. Let's get out ahead of this, and uh, I think there's real motivation to to be there, um, and. I, that mentality is kind of what, what what gives me some what gives me some hope that we can we, we can solve some of these big problems. Great. Well, everyone, join me in thanking Congressman Moore for being here today. <clears throat>